Good morning. I'm Anton Lishan, General Manager of the Smith Family Victoria and host of today's webinar. Welcome to hundreds of people from all over Australia. And from the get-go, thank you so much for your generous support of the Smith Family's commitment to breaking the poverty cycle through education. We simply couldn't do it without you. We have produced this webinar to engage and connect you with great young people who are overcoming barriers to education and fulfilling bright, prosperous lives thanks to the work of the Smith family. And our work has always been essential. We've known for decades that education is the life changer. And so we've honed the evidence, the programs and the policies. We implement at scale and we're achieving excellent results. So really, we can be optimistic, but they are challenging targets that we set for ourselves and the world's not getting any easier, particularly for the 1.2 million children and young people living below the poverty line. Bushfires, floods, and now the global pandemic. These are all topics that we will talk through with Jared and Felicity, ably assisted by Smita. But I am thinking about everybody across Australia and accordingly, reconciliation is so important to us at the Smith family. Let me acknowledge the traditional lands on which we're sitting. We're in CBD Melbourne, Queen Street on the banks of the Yarra. And these are the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. It's formed our conversation with Jared and Felicity today, but your questions are still welcome. So use the question and answer facility and our team will answer in real time or if you've sent us some curly ones, take a little bit more time to get those answers through to you. Thanks for tuning in. As I say, you're going to hear about the passion and ability of young people unlocked through Learning for Life, thanks to your generous sponsorship. You're going to hear about children moving through primary school, secondary school to TAFE and university, and on to employment. Great for them, sensational for Australia. So, Really, let's get onto it. Let's meet the panel and hear about Learning for Life, hear about the theory and practice behind it. Smita, good morning. Could you kick us off by introducing yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Good morning. Uh, my name's Smita. I'm the Regional Programs Manager here in Victoria. My role is to oversee the Learning for Life Scholarship Associated Programs and our 55 or so team members based across the state. So our Learning for Life team members are based across 14 locations in Victoria and they're really working hand in hand with our families, our students and our schools, supporting students through from prep through to year 12 and into their tertiary studies. I personally have a teaching background, so I get a lot of joy out of watching our students and following them on that journey, whether it's those you know, little grade sixes improving their reading levels, or whether it's getting to tune into the wonderful stories like Felicity and Jared today and just hear the amazing things they've accomplished. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Smita. And Felicity, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Felicity and I'm currently studying my Bachelor of Psychology, so close to finishing. Um, and I'm also working as a music teacher in Ballarat. Unreal. So you've come two hours down the road from Ballarat, freezing part of Victoria. Very chilly. <laughs> okay. Um, bit of road works to contend with, but you made it. I made it. Fantastic. Good to have you here, Felicity. Jared, please introduce yourself. Uh, well, I'm not at university anymore. I um, actually uh, graduated about three years ago with a Bachelor of um, Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I've been in the workforce now and um, mainly just working in construction um, as a mechanical engineer. Um, it's been great and uh, yeah. Unreal. Okay, and as General Manager uh, of Victoria, my role is to implement our one national strategy in a place-based way, what suits Victoria and the 14 places in which we operate of the 91 across the nation and to ensure that we're well represented in all sectors, corporate, philanthropy, government, education, the media. Now, let's begin our conversation. Uh, Jared, please set the scene. What was it like growing up? Whereabouts were you? And, and how was life starting off for you and your family? Well, my life before the Smith family actually was, um, you know, it happened about 20 years ago. Um, the Smith family came into my life at a very early stage. Um, but from what I can remember, I was at primary school at that time. And at that time, 
you know, life's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I've got school, I've got my family, I've got my PlayStation. <laughs> and to me, that's all that mattered. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty middle class, and pretty normal. Okay, mum, dad, and uh, probably be a big fat mortgage. Exactly. Okay, all right, let's see where we get to. Felicity, um, I know that the Smith family has been part of your life for a long time. Do you remember life before the Smith family came onto the scene? Um, not greatly. Uh, I would have been, yeah, very little. Mid-primary school, um, the Smith family sort of became part of our lives. And I come from a family of four kids and both of my parents. Um, are you I'm big sister or little sister? I'm the second eldest. I okay. have two brothers and a sister. Yeah. And are you the star of the family or there's somebody else? Oh, <laughs> we all have our special traits. We're very unique and get along really well with the different um, skills and talents that we all share with each other. Okay. Um, and it's always been in regional Victoria? Your, your family's been in Ballarat, is it? Yeah, mostly. Uh, we moved to Ballarat when I was born. Um, my family are from Beaufort. Okay. All right. Well, please, let's just wait and we'll really unpack this conversation in a moment. But let me... Um, step through what Learning for Life is as a reminder to you about the support you give us. And Smita can endeavour to describe the profile of Learning for Life participants. In the Smith family, partnerships are the enabler of our proven work. We partner, as I said, with corporate, with government, with individuals, and that makes for a less polarised society and it makes for a more engaged philanthropic offering from the Smith family. At the heart of our partnerships is the quintessential Learning for Life scholarship. A relationship that partners with mums, dads and guardians, awards them a scholarship because of the commitment they have to their child's life. Yes, they tick the box on the Centrelink benefit needs, but we really tune into their ambition for their kids' future through education. And as a result, we sign a partnership agreement and we give three things to families over a long time, potentially 17 years from the first year of school right through TAFE University. And those three things are a small amount of cash every year for excursions, uniforms and books, so no kid gets left behind in the schoolyard in the classroom or when the bus pulls off to the zoo. The second element is a qualified education support worker to help loving parents who might not know everything about complicated pathways through school to university and employment to help uh, navigate ways through those places. And thirdly, there's a suite of programs that help students uh, in, participate in learning clubs, digital literacy, financial literacy, a range of skills that we all need to get on, but not every family and social network is able to offer that to their children. So, that's the gift we're able to give thanks to your generous support. And the partnership has expectations of families as well. Attendance at school is critical, 90% minimum. Submission of school reports so that we can track what's going well and where additional support could be offered. And our profiles to begin a relationship with sponsors and students and families so that there's an active engagement in children's education. That's Learning for Life. And Smita, if you could describe the profile of our participants, please. Yeah, of course. I think the first thing that really stands out to me is that commitment to education, that determination and focus, and also the resilience of our families, often in quite complex and you know, um, challenging circumstances. I suppose a high level kind of overview of their profile out of those 56,000 students nationally, we see about over 40% of our uh, families come from single parent households. We see uh, one in five identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, approximately 40% of our students and over 50% of our parents have either a disability or a health issue. And over 75% are actually unemployed or not currently in the workforce. And we certainly saw that compounded during COVID. And the other thing that I'd really feature is that for many of our students, they can be the first in family to finish high school, let alone tertiary studies. Mm. Okay. And I know Felicity is going to um, tell a bit of that story. So. 56,000 children on Learning for Life, 20% uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. That means a participation rate of around 11,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Thanks, Smita. All right, Felicity, Jared, let's pick it up and see 
why the Smith family needed to come into your life and how it started to help. So um, let's start with Jared. There you were, mum, dad and the big mortgage, um, but life wasn't all sm smiles and easy times. What happened and how did the Smith family come into your life? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting timeline because it happened so far, so long ago, but you know, basically if I could start from somewhere, you know, I was, I was asleep in my room basically um, and I got woken up. Um, the paramedics told me that my mum's in a hospital and I didn't know it at the time, but uh, from then life really sort of um, got flipped upside down when I learned in, in, in Letty is that she actually had um, stage three bowel cancer. Um, the effects of this where she couldn't work. Um, How old were you when you got woken up? Um, I, couldn't have been, I couldn't have been any more than six or, or seven yeah. years old. I was okay. still in, That's yeah, pretty heavy. I was still in primary school. Yeah, so it was, it was, pretty, um, it was, pretty, it was pretty negative um, mm. on my life. Um, but basically, due to an inability to work, um, basically my parents uh, split up and we unfortunately lost the mortgage. Um, cost of living goes up. Uh, income goes down, uh, you find you're uh, moving from smaller house to smaller house and um, bills, school fees, you know, they, they pile up and uh, it doesn't uh, bode well. For, um, okay, yeah. so you're starting off about age six, mum and dad in the family home, future ahead of you, and then things start to fall away. I am just going to um, highlight that um, your mum's alive and well. She is alive. Yes. Proud of all Thank that you're God. achieving. She's probably watching right now. Yeah. All right. Hello, Mrs. Jared. Um, okay. That is a heavy point we've got to. Smith family's coming on board. Felicity, what happened in your household? Yeah, I was pretty young as well. Um, so the Smith family came into our family uh, when I was about 10. And um, my dad had just lost a job that he'd had for his whole career. Um, he was just made redundant one day, came home from work mm. and never went back. Um, so uh, my brother at the time had just begun high school and he was really keen on getting involved in a lot of sports programs, excursions, a lot of cycling. Um, so was approaching our parents about asking for these, um, for these opportunities. And so then we heard about the Smith family and met the eligibility, talked to some people. Um, myself and my siblings all started the sponsorship from there. And it really took a turn. But I guess as a, as a really young girl, I perhaps didn't realise the impact that it had on our family. Um, Mum and Dad never made it like anything was mm. wrong. Um, they didn't want us to notice that perhaps things were really difficult, so. Yeah. Okay, okay, and so that's, that's neat. You weren't wearing that badge of poverty. Mum and Dad weren't necessarily crying every night, but you're having dreams and, and needing things at school. Your, your brother wants to go in bike races. Mm. What sort of um, opportunities were you able to do as a result of being on the Learning for Life program? What things did you buy or do? Yeah, um, I guess it just made those extra things more achievable. So the excursions, um, I was able to uh, start instrumental lessons on the flute when I began high school as an extracurricular. Um, but yeah, mum was at home and dad did find another job eventually. Um, so. Yeah, it was, it was just that extra pick up because it really could have gone another direction, I think. Right, okay, and I, I think that's really significant that as resources and networks close down, opportunities and connections close down. And so certainly from a personal perspective, if my success in life was measured on English and maths, I would not be a standout success, not that I am. <laughs> um, what I'm highlighting is the opportunity for students to follow their passion and to realise success, be it through music or cycle racing, makes going to school bearable if you're not flourishing in maths and helps you have pride in yourself and, and pick your way to your better future. Jared, um, can you remember Learning for Life coming on or can you look back now and think, ah, oh, it's because of the scholarship that I was able to do X, Y, yes, or Z? Yes, exactly, I, I can. Um, and, and, and just like Felicity, I can't remember the exact 
point of time that my mum uh, had contacted the Smith family mm -hmm. because it was, it was almost seamless because did she find it or did we find you i honestly i honestly <coughs> don't know it was so long ago it would have been through a school partnership you know when i first heard about it actually was that there'd be leslie and keith my first sponsors and i still remember that name leslie and keith yeah. first sponsors thank you leslie and keith yeah I, I didn't understand why at the time but mum would just give me this letter from these sponsors and which she would tell me that they're providing my my school fees wow. money for excursions school camps books and she said you're going to sit here and you're going to write back to them. <laughs> You've got a good mum. You know, I didn't understand why. I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks, Leslie and Keith. Um, so that was kind of the uh, initial stages. Unreal. And were there things that you bought or did at school um, that you otherwise would not have done? But potentially, I mean, I guess we'll never know. Yeah. Um, I, I know that in high school, uh, I, I obviously I never lived an extravagant lifestyle. Yeah. But if there's a school camp, if there's an excursion, school books, uh, uniforms. Uh, I'm you know. thinking as an engineer, you probably did maths to a high standard. Not quite, actually. That, <laughs> happened, that happened at uni, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realise I was okay at math until I was at university, but... Right, yeah. <laughs> right. Because certainly um, a challenge for Learning for Life households is not enough money to follow your passion and strengths. And that leads to choosing the cheap subjects. Maybe you can't afford the 250 or so dollar calculator, and so you don't do maths. Um, and as a result, that ambition and ability gets shut down. Maybe you get on in life, but it's not the life that was going to be. There's actually a point on that I want to make. Sometimes if you go to um, schools such as mine, which were underrepresented in, in certain subjects, say speci specialist mathematics, okay, you can't you can't do that subject because the number of students who are able to want to do that mm. that subject aren't there so I, I just can't I couldn't do that unit so there you are a bright young kid in Western Melbourne gifted at maths but not a lot of people are in that place and so yeah, your you school's can't. not offering yeah. that subject yeah a different story if, if I was at a better resource school who could provide those um, you know that, that learning yeah okay um, do either of you remember programs because um, uh, were there programs that you did, Jared, on, on Learning for Life? Yeah, there's a, there's a few programs I did. Um, obviously, there's, there, there was mentorship and um, the, the Learning for Life scholarship throughout, uh, throughout tertiary studies. Um, from high school, there was uh, some tutoring sessions that I went to that the Smith family is holding at my local library after school. Mum would take me there, um, which was mainly for you know, science and STEM fields and stuff, which was a, a very uh, substantial help to me. 100%. Yeah. Um, I went to university, but I can't do maths, and I, maybe your mum's not up to engineering maths either. So where do you find that skill? You found it at the Learning Club. Uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of just started as wanting to, choosing something that you want to do and then finding ways to teach yourself how to do those things. I mean, one way is Google, one way is a textbook, but yep. another way that really makes it a lot easier is if you've got people there who know what they're teaching to teach you those things. And that's what we got. Yeah. That's yeah. what we got with the, uh, the tutoring. And the story that you started for me was one of circles growing. Mum and dad at home, yeah. you growing up, future opening up. But then you described how things fell away. Mum and dad fell away, house fell away, and it sounded as though social and professional networks fell away. Yeah. Was the mentor, what did the mentor do? Like, what did you talk about and how did that help your pathway? So the, the mentor was a lot of help in ways that, you know, um, I just can't, couldn't, I didn't have access to. By the way, my mentor, his name is Brett Oldfield. Is he, is he tuned <laughs> I, in? I, I don't know. I've been speaking to him in a, in a few years. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it was great. Um, so coming from my background, no one has gone to university, no one's an engineer, no one's you know, mm. so it's hard for me to know what the profession's like. I mean, I, thinking about it now, I think it's crazy that, you know, we base our career decisions on, you know, at the time was a, it was a course guide that, mm. but that my school would be handing out. Like, okay, I think I want to do you this. You weren't having these conversations with anybody no, like, else. You can't do that, those, you can't have those conversations with anybody else. And that's why Brett um, was such a big help. He sort of, um, uh, sort of grounded your expectations mm -hmm. um, of what to expect how to get, because once you do an engineering degree, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can go into defense, manufacturing, construction, you can do anything. Right. Uh, so, and I didn't know how to navigate that, that sort of, um, that field, and that's why Brett was um, a big help. Yeah, okay. Um, and 
Uh, I know that Brett, as a mentor, um, probably started off thinking he was going to give so much to his mentee. And what me mentors and supporters tell us is they're blown away by how much they get back. And I just can imagine, Jared, that he spending time with you and seeing your potential and him helping to lay out some pathways for you to consider, he would be over the moon to think that you're a practicing engineer oh, today. Yeah. 100%. You've, you've paid it forwards. Nice one. Um, Felicity, what programs did you get involved in and how did they help you? So many. Um, I can even remember the student to student reading program and calling up my buddy in grade six and we would read a book over the phone to one another. But so you were getting support in reading or you were helping a little kid? Both. So I started as the uh, child learning to read and then I came full circle and started helping other children younger than me as well. Um, but I do have a particular program similar to that of mentoring that really stands out um, in my memories throughout school life is the SMARTS program, okay. um, which was a nine week uh, tutoring program, especially for music and the arts. Yep. Um, so we had specialist teachers coming to our school once a week and taking us for master classes and workshops. And um, we got to the end of the program and I actually had the opportunity as as a, you know, just a government school from Ballarat, um, a student, we, they took us all here to Melbourne and we did a show in Melba Hall. Um, and I remember taking on um, something I'd never done before as a musician in, I was year nine at mm -hmm. the time, and I did an improvisation piece, um, which was a huge step for me um, in my music skills. Um, so it was a, a turning point and I think the, the specialist teachers that we had visit us equipped me with that skill in year nine to then think, oh my gosh, I could actually keep doing this. Um, yeah, it was really fun. Unreal. Um, what I'm hearing from both of you is um, love and care at home, schools that want the best for their students and yet the resource base isn't there. Um, Felicity, you're making me smile and, and feel warm because I was at Melba Hall. I've had the pleasure of working with the Smith family for a long time and I saw you as a little schoolgirl <laughs> um, playing in that concert. And to think that you had that ability in music as a primary, junior, secondary student, you started to learn, you came to University of Melbourne um, and did that concert and soon we'll discover that it's your career. Yeah, um, it became so real in that moment, like to be up there and to have somebody believe that I could do that, it just unlocked so many things. If you see it, you can dream it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Smita, we've got the personification of learning for life here. Um, any reflections or observations? Oh, other than the fact that the two, <laughs> these two are just incredible. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit intense. <laughs> um, yeah, look, what really is standing out for me is that, you know, it's wonderful. We hear that the, you know, the financial component is important, but it is a component. And it really is that, uh, that additional support, the programs that really form that holistic wraparound of support for our students. And, you know, and to your point, um, Jared, around the opportunities for schools, it's so important that we're partnered with our schools and offering those programs so that our students have those opportunities to them. But also, it's not just about offering the opportunity, it's about working with in partnership with our families and students to ensure that they actually have the capacity and confidence to take up those opportunities, just like you know you talked about Felicity, that's just incredible. So what a wonderful way to see it personified. Mm, yeah, um, listening to you Smita, you highlight for me that um, the targeted strategy, our theory of change, really makes a difference. Buzzwords of um, entrenched disadvantage, cycles of disadvantage, but this is what we're breaking. It is excellent that other agencies and governments address disadvantage and education. But what stands out for me is the partnership with students and families, 17 years, first year of school through to graduation of university and TAFE. It takes a generation to steer the ship around and we are here waving on the pier <laughs> saying, have a good life. Um, Felicity, the Smith family's byline is everyone's family. And that applies to your family in the sense that, as you've already said, learning for life wasn't only for you. I think your mum and siblings were in it. Mm, Tell us about that, please. 
Yeah, um, so I think what I'd like to share is that my mum also took part in the Smith family programs that were offered because it wasn't just for the students. Um, so she started attending these like short courses at the local library because you know she was at home all the time and all her children were then at school. She sort of looked for something new to try. Mm -hmm. um, that was the Clementi program in partnership with ACU. And she ended up doing quite well and really enjoying herself. And this inspired her to attend university as a mature age student. Uh, she was completing her bachelor degree in nursing um, at the same time as I was doing my VCE studies. Okay, so hang on. You're at the kitchen table and mum's studying and you're studying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she had bigger textbooks than I did. But yeah, it was so fun to watch her go through that. And she would um, come to us as you know, her high school students, her children, and say, oh, I've got an exam tomorrow. And um, be like, it's okay, mum. And um, off she went. And she's now um, working happily as a nurse for six, seven years now. She's got a fantastic wow. job in Ballarat. And just seeing my mum do that so successfully, I followed not long after her to oh, university. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it seems that your family has an appetite to help others, and yet when life got really tired, you couldn't you couldn't do that. That was denied you your your values and, and care for others. There was just too little to go around. Is that mm, how it was? And that's so frustrating. You know, um, we had so much to give, but you know, can't share that unless you're helping yourself first, I suppose. Um, so taking those leaps and, you know, starting programs and seeing that you can do things and then sharing that with others, I think is really important. That's unreal. So we can fly over Ballarat, we can lift the roof on your house, we can see you and mum studying together, but then we can see the Ballarat community enriched because you're teaching students and your mum is nursing patients. That Absolutely. is very nice. <laughs> Unreal. Um, Jared, are there ways, at, you know, you're, a, you're at a, a milestone in your life, you've graduated, you're employed. Do you look back on learning for life and, and realise that um, your trajectory, your pathway changed as a result of it? Absolutely. Um, in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, first off, in, in the most obvious way is that I started in the construction industry, working at a, you know, a, a tier one contractor where normally you would have to put your application in amongst 500 others just to get a chance to get that, that spot as a graduate for that company. But through contacts with the Smith family, I was able to get that position um, as a graduate engineer. Right, so you're describing you're, you're highly capable, you're doing well at uni, but you're running a race against others. Exactly. And those students, might, their grades might not be as good as yours, Exactly. But you literally saw them getting ahead of you? Exactly, because the reality of it is you can do well at university, but that is not the be all and end all. It's who you know, it's contacts. And a lot of people that I knew at university have dads, uncles, friends who have positions of authority at these companies. And it's basically just through a back door. I didn't have those, uh, those contacts. And that's why I'm really grateful to the Smith family for, for, for having that, that, that contact within the industry. Yeah, I think I've heard you say, but I might be wrong, that as you were getting qualified or when you had your degree, yeah. beautiful thing and a, a moment of pride to hang on the wall, you didn't actually know what engineers did. If you went to a firm and sat down at a workstation, you wouldn't know like, what exactly. like, it sounds It sounds so silly, but yeah. I, I, you know, for, for fully, I didn't understand what an engineer did. Conceptually understood, you know, you, you use science and physics, manipulate that to do things that you know help society. Right? Yeah. But in terms of the day to day, yeah, sitting at a desk, how to write an email, how to write an email, how to talk to the boss. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, I, I didn't know those things, so um, that's why it was it was difficult to get your foot in the door in that way. And that's what I get excited about the Smith family. An envelope with cash from a supporter is essential. We yes. need that to. Um, realise our evidence base and policy and programs. But it's the relationship that connects young people with those who have the talent and treasure to share yes. that really opens up pathways like yours. Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, that's a powerful story. And Felicity, yours is too, because you went to a school in Ballarat as a student 
And today you're a teacher there. <laughs> Tell us about that place. I remember the phone call uh, two weeks out from the term starting for a new year. I'd been graduated out of the school for a year. I'd taken a gap year. And then the next year rolls around and I get this phone call. Can you start work next, you know, next week? Oh, so hang on. You've done uni. So I you're did. You're partly qualified. Partly. I did a cert for in music industry. Okay. As my as my And break. you've applied for jobs, have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh -huh. I, and I always knew I wanted to study, so I actually had my bachelor degree deferred, ready for me to start that the year I started teaching. Um, so it was so funny the way it came about. I just got thrown in the deep end. Um. <laughs> so your school so you'd applied for a variety of places in Ballarat and your school rang up and said we We'd want you, pretty much. Yeah. And it was just such a, a thrill and an honour. And I already knew the system so well. And it's a beautiful place to to teach and to learn. Like, I've seen the school develop over many years. Yep. And um, so I started part-time one day a week um, whilst also starting my bachelor degree. And it's just so lovely. I think a lot of the students took a while to start calling me by my surname instead of my first name because they still recognised me. But I was just welcomed and um, valued. And so you're in the staff room with um, colleagues who were your teachers. <laughs> yeah. And did yeah. you call them Mr Jones <laughs> and go, oh no, it's Barry or whatever? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Unreal. You're making me think, Felicity, about how densely populated our learning for life world is. Um, the coincidence of you working at a partner school of ours. Smita, how many partner schools do we have in Victoria? Over 110, probably around 115 or so. And what's the definition of a partner school? Uh, a school that is willing to work hand in hand with us uh, to deliver our kind of core outcomes. So our advancement, um, engagement and of course uh, attendance. Yep, exactly. So it's those relationships that are really making a difference. And and Felicity, you're making me um, remember that um, to stay informed, the Smith family has a principals advisory group. Principals from across Australia unite and uh, meet face to face or over Zoom to inform the Smith family about their schools and our strategy and making sure results are as strong as possible. And your principal sits on our principal advisory group. Um, so it is a very tight um, series of relationships we enjoy right across Australia. Mm. Um, I'm very excited to think that you're a teacher there. Now, you're, you're not, uh, a music teacher is a beautiful thing because it goes beyond maths and English. Yay. <laughs> um, but you do more than that, don't you? There's an there's a element, there's an angle in, in music that you're pursuing. Yeah, so I'm particularly interested um, in the way that music affects the brain and um, music therapy as a potential career pathway. So I'm just tidying up my bachelor in psychology because that really gets into the nitty gritty stuff. But then marrying that with my passion and knowledge for music as I've learned over the years. And I think what really kicked that into gear was getting the opportunity to teach these children to play an instrument. Mm -hmm. I started seeing other changes in their confidence, self-esteem, even just general um, ability as a person. I've even worked with younger students who have um, intellectual disorders or on the spectrum and they just light up when they realise they can actually do something. You give someone an opportunity or an instrument and they just they light up it's great good for you and lucky for them to have a teacher like you um, ladies and gentlemen we've been talking to uh, Jared and Felicity with Smita about learning for life a program that's been refined and grown to an incredible scale and success over 30 years and as I've mentioned 1.2 million children and young people living below the poverty line an essential offering to help unlock opportunities. But you look at the present, the near past and the future, and there's reasons to be concerned. Floods, fires, and now the pandemic. What has that done to children doing it tough at school? And what does it mean now and into the future? Every Australian has lived with the impacts of COVID-19. In Victoria, it has been intense. A five kilometre perimeter, an 8pm curfew, playgrounds literally chained up, 
all retail stores shut down. Uh, to varying degrees, other states and territories have had these experiences. But I've got to tell you, as a Victorian, particularly intense. And through the Learning for Life Smith family lens, we're looking at education. We're looking at Victorian schools closed for 21 weeks of a 40 week academic year. More than half not on school grounds. All families found it tough to homeschool, but when you think about families doing it tougher, single mums, no computer hardware, no data, no affinity to learn and concentrate, it is very intense. So I'm interested, Jared and Felicity and Smeda, on your observations about 2020, ISO, shutdown, how was it for family and friends, and, and what do you think it's doing for our, our future? Who wants to go first? Tell us uh, a COVID-19 story. Um, so a personal story for me, um, I didn't, the consequences for me from COVID-19 weren't as bad as they could have been mm -hmm. for many people. Um, I was still employed for most of the pandemic. But having said that, two months prior to the pandemic, I had moved out of home to share an apartment with a colleague. Right. And then the pandemic hit. Yeah. And then all the plans I set for myself, I'm going to go out of the city. The Uber cost is going to be like 15 bucks. <laughs> the commute is going to be shorter. I'm going to have my own. I'm going to be in Yarraville. I'm going to be in the cafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to be a hip yeah. young man. Yeah. And then the lockdown hit. And then suddenly, I was spending like 24 hours in this apartment, <laughs> working, living. I couldn't yeah. leave. Yeah. And how long did that go for? That was like 20 weeks. Wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we had um, the first long lockdown and then the so second longer one. Yeah, okay. So months. Yeah, I remember that now. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was pretty... And then we got bad. the Valentine's Day one, but... Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah so it was, it so was you're bad. there with your... Um, my, it was my, my workmate. Yeah, so yeah. you thought that you'd be sort of young yeah. bachelors coming and going, but yeah. you ended up in ISO together. Yes. Right. Yes. Yep. Okay. The only thing we did together was we bought a bench press and some weights and put it in the lounge and we'd just be working out in the day. Like Fantastic. literally like we are in solitary yeah, confinement in a prison. Yeah, I'm beginning to smell that apartment and I'm not <laughs> liking yeah. it. Um, oh yeah. Did it impact on you professionally? Uh, employment or, or other areas? It, it, it did employment wise. Um, I was on the Westgate Tunnel Project in, in Melbourne and it already been experiencing issues before COVID, but mm -hmm. I guess it all sort of uh, coalesced into a redundancy. Uh, but you know, I, I had the contacts on that right. project to get um, work with the, the Metro Tunnel project, okay. um, which was great. Um, you know, as I said before, con contacts, uh, unfortunately, are everything. Yeah. Um, and so I, so I, you'd I build up those right. foundations yeah. and they just carried you through ISO. Exactly. Okay. That's intense. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, a really common story. Yeah. Felicity, what, what was it like for you at, at university or at school, at home? Yeah, I guess I, I have two sort of sides to it, um, both as a student myself and as a teacher of younger students. Um, so being a school teacher for one day a week was hard enough. I can't imagine what school teachers across Victoria had to go through. Um, <clears throat> I remember sitting at my desk for six hours straight on video conference with my <laughs> flute students and they so would what, be... You're... <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. So they're playing and the sound's Have going funny. Have you got funny. earphones in listening yeah. to bad flute playing? Yeah, yeah. and it was um, very tricky because sometimes they'd, you know, they wouldn't be able to see what they were doing and it was, yeah, it was challenging in all sorts of ways. Um, I also had a massive drop in student attendance and even starting again returning to school nobody has picked up like they don't know about these instruments the music program has really suffered with the intake this year um did you lose students because we know that around it's it's declining but at the peak 24 percent of learning for life participants did not have hardware and data so the idea mm. that they would homeschool was really in this virtual world non-existent. They physically so couldn't log on, you yeah. you disconnected from some of your students? Yeah, and living um, in areas without Wi-Fi connection. Mm -hmm. um, some students would say, oh, I've, I've got too much other work to do, I can't make it to my music lesson. Yep. Um, yeah, so it was really tough. And as a teacher, I felt like I was giving so much and putting out all these resources and you know online games and things to do but just not getting anything back because it's really difficult um i just want to check um that is intense 
Um, mm. On the upside, have you bumped into parents or students who are um, transformed in their appreciation of teachers? Are they saying, my God, I didn't know how hard it was, you're a superstar? Yeah, it was, I got a few emails from parents, you know, um, keeping me updated on their kids and saying, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping my child, you know, engaged in some way because music provides that joy yep. for them. Um, but it was so it was so interesting at our house during the pandemic. Um, my brother interesting. was interesting. <laughs> my brother was homeschooling from the kitchen table. I was right. in my bedroom at my desk, and um, my younger sister was doing her art degree online as well, and she just never came out of her room. But mm -hmm. um, as a as a university student myself as well. Um, was difficult to the next level. Um, all my lectures, all my classes, everything was online. The staff were great, um, but you still had to do it all yourself. Like university is self-directed anyway, but this was this was go and do it all on your own. Um, and I lost connection with a lot of my uh, classmates, um, friends that I'd made on campus, yep. and haven't reconnected with them because we're still learning online. Like they say, if something can be taught remotely, it should be. So right. that's just how it is. Yep. Um, very intense last year, this year unknown, and we're still seeing the pipeline flow through. Smita, any observations regarding um, COVID-19 and impacts to our work? Yeah, yeah, look, of course, absolutely. I think for our team members, it has been really challenging because we've been right there with our schools, with our families throughout that experience. And, you know, we've touched today a little bit around the hardship that our families experience, but I think COVID took those, that existing hardship and just compounded it. And, you know, whether it was financial insecurity or the digital divide that you referred to, Anton, or, um, or mental health. And, you know, we've really had families who were living paycheck to paycheck already. And then suddenly, you know, mum loses her job or we've had those students who don't have access to a device or the Internet. And suddenly they're thrust into this environment where they're trying to keep up with their peers in a remote learning environment. It just really, I suppose, gave us this sense of for us as a team and with the Smith family is that we are really there with our families, you know, before, during and after. Not so long ago, we were supporting families through the devastation of the bushfires in mm. Gippsland. Yep. Um, so whatever life brings, I think that's the really important sense um, of that support is that we're in it together. We're, we're on that journey with you. Mm. Yeah, we've got established trusting relationships between our education support workers and the families and um, it gets even tougher and yet we're there to walk beside them. Mm, I can reiterate on that too, because I remember throughout um, the pandemic as a student, I could just call up my tertiary coordinator and say, hey, I need a chat, like I'm really struggling right now. And having that person to go to is just so uh, relaxing, you know? There's somebody out there who believes in you. Right, so they're our Learning for Life tertiary coordinator, so call out to our team, well done and thank you. We're on the home stretch now, I'm wondering if there's um, final reflections when you both look back on life and your positive pathway, what difference in your life, Jared, has the Smith family made over the years? I think uh, personally for me, uh, the support of the Smith family has given me confidence, uh, something to sort of lean back on because, you know, when I think of the fact that there's a whole organisation structured consisting of people who are all there to see me um, succeed, see hundreds, thousands of other students like me succeed um, in their personal, educational um, and, and, and future life. Um, it's just given me the confidence to know that no matter what I'm facing uh, at, um, at any stage, whether it's at uni or at work, that um, you know, there's someone batting for me. Yeah, and yeah. It, it makes, makes, makes all the difference really for me. A real team. Yeah. Uh, a sponsor who writes and connects with you, an education support worker, and, and then your school and family. Exactly, yeah. Thank you, Jared. Felicity, the Smith family in your life? Uh, I think you said this earlier that it's hard to know where you'd be without it. Um, had I not received the, um, the sponsorship early days, I think I wouldn't have gained the opportunity to uh, start music lessons because it's extra cost, you know. Um, so I hired an instrument from the school, took part in the music lessons, uh, discovered that I loved it yeah. and, you know, I've continued that 
right through my school life um, and now teaching it and thinking about it being a future career pathway. It's just incredible to think that I may not have stumbled across it without that help. Unreal. Um, we're going to close. Smita, we're going to go back to work and I'm uh, going to put in double time because so <laughs> we've got more to do, haven't we? Um, <laughs> that is sensational. Thanks for your contribution, Smita. Jared and Felicity, it is an absolute pleasure and privilege to sit and listen to you. Um, thank you for giving your time, um, taking time off work to have this conversation with us. It's really appreciated. Thanks for letting Excellent. us share. No worries at all. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. That is um, listening to two professional adults with a burning ambition and career ahead of them um, with primary school, secondary, university behind them. They represent hundreds of thousands of young people across Australia who have innate ability and dreams as do their parents and friends. And yet sadly, uh, many of their peers face barriers that are almost insurmountable and their future is not so positive. So that is confronting and that drives us every day to succeed and grow. To you, I say thank you so much. Be optimistic to think that Australia has individuals like this. You've contributed to Felicity and Jared's future and their contribution to our nation is phenomenal. So thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation and I hope the rest of your day goes very well. Goodbye.